In this episode of The Biggest Jesus, we're going to look at one of the most important word studies you can do. This is the word study that changed my life. Christianity says Jesus will torment billions of people forever. That's a long time, and that's not enough. Don't swallow their lies or their tiny Jesus. Biggestjesus.com In this study, we're going to look at the Greek noun ion and the Greek adjective ionios. We'll be focusing on the noun ion because to understand the adjective, we need to have a firm grasp on what the noun means. So that's the focus of this study. Now this word has to do with time and how God uses time to deal with humanity and the segments of time that he has created. And we will see that as we go through this study. But understanding this word is key to understanding how God's will to save all people will be accomplished by Jesus. So understanding this word will give you a bigger picture of God's plan for mankind and help you understand some details that may not be clear in mistranslated Bibles. So let's dig into this word ion and understand how it works with the adjective ionios to give us the picture of God's life that he promises to people and God's judgments that are coming on people. Here we have a chart of the Ionian times or Ionian times. The concordant literal New Testament translates Aeon as Eon. It's not a pure literal transliteration but it's very close. We have Aeon and Eon. Now if we look at this we can see there are five different eons. One, two, three, four, five. The red line on the left indicates the beginning of the eons. The red line on the right indicates the consummation or end of the eons. So God is working through the Eonian times to bring about his purpose. And in fact, God is called the king of the eons in 1 Timothy 1.17 and he is directing the purpose of the eons, Ephesians 3.11 and Ephesians 1.11. Now just to kind of give you a preview of some of the things we're going to be talking about, some will have immortality and Eonian life through eons 4 and 5, which have not begun yet. We are in eon 3, which is called the present wicked eon, Galatians 1.4, and Satan is called the god of this eon. So we do have things happening with God before the eons are created. And inside this black box here, let's let's take a look at just a few details about the Greek noun aeon and the Greek adjective aeonios. So the Greek noun aeon equals English eon. And it occurs about 125 times. And the variance is dependent upon the New Testament Greek manuscripts that are used. There's a little bit of variation in the numbers. Uh, the second line here is absolutely key in understanding the ions and the definition of ion. Over half of the occurrences of ion are plural. That's key moving forward. So an ion is an eon, an age, or a period of time. And ion is often mistranslated as eternity, world, forever and forever and ever. Take a look at Mark 3.29, Matthew 13.39, 40 and 49 and we will get to those. And the Greek adjective Ionios equals the English Ionian and that occurs about 70 times in the New Testament. So all told we have about 195 instances of the noun and the adjective to combined. Now, Aeonios is often mistranslated as eternal, everlasting, forever, Matthew 25, 46, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, Hebrews 6, 2. But I'm making this statement at the, at the beginning, and, and we'll see this as we go through this study. No judgment, destruction, or punishment is eternal, everlasting, or forever. And that's going to be based on this study that we're going to be looking at. And it's very important here to see in 1 Corinthians 10.11, the scriptures speak of the consummations, plural, of the eons, plural. So each eon, eon 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 
each eon has its own consummation and there's a final consummation this red line over here of the eons of the eonian times let's take a look at this over here all is out of god through god and for god romans 11:36 we have to have a definition of eternity and we'll get we'll look at this again and probably throughout this study the proper definition of eternity is no beginning and no end now as we look through this let's realize going back here just quickly over half of the occurrences of ion are plural keep that in mind as we go through our study now in 1st Corinthians 2 7 2 Timothy 1 9 and Titus 1 2 tells us that there was um, duration before the eons and Hebrews 1 2 is key it says God makes the eons through Jesus so God created these time frames in which to do his work with mankind now his work with mankind and his uh, existence with mankind will extend beyond that and I put this here and we all live happily ever after when God is all in all first Corinthians 15 28 Luke 1 33 everything is created by God so we have to understand that and this is important going forward to some will have immortality and Eonian life through eons 4 and 5 which are yet to come the rest will have immortality at the consummation of the eons all will have everlasting life 1 Corinthians 15 20 through 28 so why is this study so important to understanding God's plan for all mankind um, that Christ actually saved all people on the cross and all people will come to realize their salvation um, in God's timing this word study that we're looking at, Aeon and Aeonios, is key to understanding this. And getting over and understanding this word is a big hurdle that will open your mind to see that it is very doable for God to save all people. Let's take a look here at, this is 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's look at verse 4. It's talking about our Savior God says who wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth so this tells us it's God's will for all to be saved and come into a realization of the truth verse 5 for there is one God and one mediator of God and mankind a man Christ Jesus who is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all the testimony in its own heiress okay so this makes it pretty clear that God wants all to be saved and he sent his son as a ransom for all so we're looking pretty good here on Jesus saving all people and there's a lot more scriptures than this but these are two key scriptures then let's look at 1st Timothy 410 a very important passage in this understanding the salvation of all it says for for this we are toiling and being reproached that we rely on the living God who is the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers. It says, the living God, who is the Savior of all mankind. Many people will say, well, he's the Savior in some sense, but he's not the Savior of all. Most of Christianity flat out contradicts and does not understand this key verse of who God is, what his plan is for all mankind. They just don't get it. And why don't they get it? I'll show you right here. Let's go to, this is in uh, Bible Gateway. We are in 2 Thessalonians 1. And this was a big hurdle that I had to overcome also. Because you, you see these scriptures that point to God being the Savior of all people, who actually does save all people. But there's a hurdle here, and this is the hurdle, and it's based on Ion and Ionios. Let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians 1. And this is talking about uh, the return of Jesus. Let's start in verse 6. For after all, it is only right for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted along with us, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, 
dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These people will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So we see that there are verses and passages that say God is the Savior of all, Jesus came to save all, which is great. That's, that's the good news. If you ever want to know what the good news of Jesus Christ is, that's it. He saved all people. But we've got this hurdle called the penalty of eternal destruction. Well, if he's the Savior of all people, but some undergo eternal destruction, there's a huge contradiction here. So what are we going to believe? That God is the Savior of all people through Jesus? and his death and resurrection, or are a lot of people, probably most people, going to be eternally destroyed for not believing in Jesus? And that's the issue and the hurdle that we're going to overcome in this study. Now, whether you believe me or not, that's up to you, but I'm going to show you through this study why eternal destruction is a mistranslation. Now, let's go on to uh, Bible Hub. And again, we see here 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, and this, this is the interlinear, so it's giving us the English in the orange, and it's giving us the Greek up above in the blue. So we see here, uh, verse 9, who the penalty will suffer of destruction eternal away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of the power of him. Now let's look at the blue. I'm not going to pronounce these words, but th this is basically following along. And then we get to where it says the word eternal, and that's the word that we're studying, aeonian. That's the, the adjective aeonian. So the destruction is aeonian, and Bible Hub also translates it as eternal, along with the New American Standard that we looked at on the previous screen. So we have a dilemma. Is God truly the Savior of all who will save all? Or do those passages not mean that, and God is actually going to eternally destroy those that don't believe in him? That's the key to this whole thing, is understanding this one word, ion, the noun, and the adjective, ionios. So let's dig into that, let's look at this closely, and we'll see that most Bibles are lying to people. So let's take a look at some definitions, translations, and usage of the noun and the adjective. So we're comparing eternity and ion and eternal and ionios, the adjectives. So the definition of eternity is duration with no beginning or end. The no end we can kind of grasp maybe. Most things we see in this life people anyway, die. Um, so it's kind of hard to imagine living forever or something lasting forever, but I think that's easier to grasp than no beginning. It's hard for us to imagine something that didn't have a beginning. So eternity, it, it's a tough thing. We just don't understand it be fully because nothing we see is eternal. Then we have ion, which is a space of time and age. So eternity has no beginning and no end, but we'll see through our study of ion, and we've already kind of seen this when we went over the chart, ions have beginnings and ends. So that's a huge difference. No beginning, no end, beginning, end. Two drastically different um, words, different definitions. Now the use of ion by the New American Standard Bible. These are the different ways that it translates ion. And obviously there's singular and plural, so we'll take that into account. But we have age, ages, and the numbers in parentheses are the numbers of times they use a particular word to translate ion. So we have age, ages, ancient time, beginning of time, course, eternal, eternity, ever, forever, forever and ever, forevermore, long ago, never, old, time, world, and worlds. Now, never is usually ion and with a negative. It's not never versus ever. So that one needs to be understood properly there. But then we have the concordant literal New Testament translation 
Oh my, look at that. One word. Ion. Eon. Doesn't that make more sense? When you look at the New American Standard Bible translations and all the different ways they translate it versus the one way they could have translated it, obviously, again, taking into account the singular and plural, it just seems to me, after learning what I've learned, that a lot of these Bible translations are up to some sneaky stuff. Why all the various translations? It's because they're trying to fit a word in with different translations because it doesn't quite fit the way they want it to based on their theology. That's why a lot of Bibles are lying to people. Now let's look at the adjective. Eternal, without beginning or end. Aeonios, pertaining to a space of time or age. Now the New American Standard Bible translation of Aeonios or Aeonian, which is usually the, the most common usage of it, but Aeonios is actually the, the base adjective spelling. We have New American Standard translation of Aeonios. We have eternal 66 times, eternity one, and forever one. So at least, at least they didn't use half a dozen to ten different ways to translate as they did with the noun. And in the Concordant Literal New Testament, we have Eonian. So the Concordant Literal New Testament, their goal was to have one English word for each Greek word. They did pretty good at that. There's a couple, well, a couple. There's probably several areas where they didn't do that. But overall, that was their goal. They, they were very successful with Ion and Ionios doing that with Eon and Eonian. So we see the difference in eternity and ion. Now as we start to go through this we'll begin to see how what we looked at earlier eternal destruction is just a bad translation that leads that has led to a lot of destructive thoughts for people. People that believe they will be eternally destroyed or their loved ones will be eternally destroyed which if you really think about it if eternity has no beginning or end, how can a being that has a beginning be eternally destroyed? If eternity has no beginning and end, but their destruction has a beginning. So right there we can see that the translation of eternal doesn't even fit with all the definitions that we just looked at. So eternal is a horrible translation. Now there are a lot of uh, Bible translations instead of using eternal they'll use everlasting but as we go through this study I'll show you that even that is a mistranslation of Aeonios because there are other Greek words that can be used that mean everlasting there's at least three ways that I know of that I've seen in the New Testament that there are Greek words there are Greek words denoting everlasting but God never uses those of judgment he uses Aeonios. So here we have Warren McGrew, who's the host of the show Idol Killer, and Chris Date, who is an annihilationist. And Chris is going to admit that Aeon means an era or an epoch, in his words. But he's going to stretch the adjective Aeonios to mean something that it does not mean. Take a listen to this. This, this Greek word that uh, deals with everlasting does it mean perpetual ongoing or a permanent action uh, that is not irrevocable? Well, so I, I think what you're what you're doing here is um, mixing. Okay, let me, let me back up a second. Uh, the answer is the former. Okay, the, the, in my in my based on my research, the Greek word ionios, um, which does derive from the noun ion, meaning an age or an epoch, an era. Um, the word Ionios, nevertheless, does seem to mean everlasting, ongoing, never-ending. Um, our contention as conditionalists is not that it means permanent and irrevocable or something like that, um, as if Ionios can carry either of these meanings. No, it means everlasting, without, without end of, dura of duration. So this may not be very nice of me, but I'm going to accuse Chris of illegally stretching that adjective. We don't allow adjectives to be stretched beyond their related nouns in normal life, so please don't swallow this tactic when someone does it under the covering of spirituality or religion. Because an aeon is an indefinite period of time, does not give anyone the right to throw out rules of language 
when teaching on a subject. So let's look at the legal use of a noun and its adjective with words that we use all the time. We have a week, which is seven days, and we have the adjective, which is weekly, pertaining to seven days. We have a year, which is 365 days, yearly pertains to that same amount, 365 days. So the noun and the adjective work together. Now, an illegal use of this, which none of us would allow and none of us would do it, a week, again, is seven days, but weekly, if we stretch that adjective out, could be 34 days, or 58 days, or 190 days. Now it's up to the person to determine what the adjective means if they're not going to anchor it to the noun. A year, which is 365 days, to normal people. Now we can say it pertains to 666 days. Hmm. All right, now it's time to get into some scriptures that show that aeon is limited in duration with a beginning and an end. Let's dig into it. These are my top verses showing the limited duration of aeon. All verses are from the Concordant Literal New Testament, CLNT, which you can read online at the link shown there. Because the Concordant Literal New Testament consistently translates aeon as eon and aeonios as eonian, you can go through every book in the New Testament to see where eon and eonian are used. So go to that link, hit on each book, hit Control F for find on your keyboard, and put eon, and you can see all the occurrences of eon and eonian in each book. It will be time well spent. Again, there's about 195 occurrences of the noun and adjective combined. So it takes a little time, but it's it's well worth the effort. If we, if we want to understand how God uses words to convey his truth, we'll put the time in. And as we go through these, I think it's important that we apply the eternity test occasionally. And this test is taking wherever eon is in the English translation, and we will put eternity there. Or if it's the plural, we will put eternities to see if eternal or eternity is a proper translation of aeon. So let's start with Hebrews 1-2. It says, in the last of these days, God speaks to us in a son, whom he appoints enjoyer of the allotment of all, through whom he also makes the eons. Again, we have the plural form of eon, eons, and over half of the occurrences of the noun, aeon, are in the plural form. Again, we have to ask the question, is there a plurality of eternities that we are dealing with? No. So here, my comments will be uh, indented here. I'm just going to make a few comments here and there. Um, I'm not going to go in depth in any of these, but I just want you to understand the eons and remember back to the chart that we looked at, the five eons. God made these before the eons. So God and Jesus were doing things before the eons even existed. So this tells us very clearly that there is uh, stuff going on before the eons. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, but we are speaking God's wisdom in a secret, wisdom which has been concealed, which God designates before, before the eons for our glory. Ephesians 3, 11, in accord with the purpose of the eons, which he, God, makes in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God has a purpose and a plan for the eons. He's not just waiting to see what humanity is going to do. He's not following all of our free wills and hoping that he can kind of make it all work in the end. That's, that's not how God is working. He's got a purpose for each and every one of the eons and for the eons as a whole. Ephesians 1.10 gives us an overarching purpose of the eons, to hit up all in the Christ, both that in the heavens and that on the earth. In 1 Corinthians 15, 28, 
sums up Christ's work at the end, the consummation of all of the eons. Then the Son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him that God may be all in all. There you have the purpose of the eons. Christ over everything, he gives it all to the Father, and then the Father is all in all. 1 Timothy 1.17 Now to the king of the eons, the incorruptible, invisible, only, and wise God, be honor and glory for the eons of the eons. So we see that God is the king of the eons. That means he's over the eons. Everything that happens within the eons is underneath his authority and his control. And he is involved in the eons with us. He didn't just create them and leave and just let us flounder for ourselves. Now, at the end of this, it says, to God be honor and glory for the eons of the eons. Now, that's speaking of the oncoming eons, which we'll look at here in just a minute. God is not on the earth currently getting the glory and honor that he is due. But he will. That time is coming. Ephesians 2.2 2, In which once you walked in accord with the eon of this world, in accord with the chief of the jurisdiction of the air, the spirit now operating in the sons of stubbornness. Now this is a very key verse. It joins the eon with the world. Now the world, as we see there in my note, is the Greek cosmos. It's Strong's number 2889. Cosmos means the system and orderly arrangement and ordered system. So basically the cosmos is the physical makeup not only of the earth but the governments, the religions, the customary ways things are done. That is the cosmos. That's the arrangement that's going on during each eon. Each eon has its corresponding world or cosmos. And we can see that very clearly in Galatians 1.4. talks about Jesus who gives himself for our sins so that he might extricate us out of the present wicked eon according to the will of our God and Father. So the, the current eon, the present eon, is wicked. That is what it is known by. And why is it a wicked eon? The cosmos is wicked. The cosmos, the things that are going on on the earth, the governments, the religions, the customary ways of doing things, they're wicked. And why is that? 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, In whom the God of this eon blinds the apprehensions of the unbelieving so that the illumination of the evangel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, does not irradiate them. So Satan is the God of this eon. That is part of the cosmos. He is actually acting as God. Now, God is over everything, absolutely and sovereignly. But during this eon, Satan is called the God of this eon. Now, here's a good spot to do an eternity test. And you can do this with any of these verses, but this is a really good one. If we put eternity in place of eon, we get Satan being the God of this eternity. How does that sit with you, that Satan will be the god of eternity? So right there we can see that aeon does not mean eternity. Let's go on. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 8. Yet wisdom are we speaking among the mature, yet a wisdom not of this aeon, neither of the chief men of this aeon who are being discarded, which not one of the chief men of this aeon knows, for if they know, they would not crucify the Lord of glory. Again, it goes back to the cosmos, the wisdom, the God of this eon. It's talking about the wisdom of men in this eon. And we're exhorted in Romans 12, 2, and not to be conformed to this eon, this present wicked eon, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, for you to be testing what is the will of God good and well-pleasing and perfect. So we're told not to conform to this wicked eon because God has given us the mind of Christ to act in a way outside and different than the cosmos, the customs of this wicked eon. 1 
1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all this befalls them. This is speaking of Israel in the wilderness after they left Egypt. All of this befell them typically, talking about the, the negative judgments and things that came on them. Yet it was written for our admonition to whom the consummations of the eons have attained. So here we see the consummations, plural, of the eons, plural. This tells us that each and every eon has a consummation or an end. This is very important. This goes back to our definition of aeon, a span of time with a beginning and an end, totally the opposite of eternity, which has no beginning and no end. Hebrews 9.26, since then he, Christ, must often be suffering from the disruption of the world. Yet now once at the conclusion of the eons, for the repudiation of sin through his sacrifice, is he manifest. So we see that this is speaking of the conclusion, singular, of the eons, plural. So ever since Christ came and did his work on the cross, the eons have been concluding. But there will be a final conclusion of the eons when sin is absolutely and fully repudiated at the very end of the eons. But this started at the cross in Christ's victory over Satan, sin, and death. And as we go through the eons, we're going to see the, the conclusion come to its full fruition with God being all in all. Matthew 13, 49. Thus shall it be in the conclusion of the eon. The messengers will be coming out and they will be severing the wicked from the midst of the just. Again, we see the conclusion of the eon. Now the enemy who sows them is the adversary. Matthew 13, 39 through 40. Now the harvest is the conclusion of the eon. Now the reapers are messengers, even as the darnel then are being culled and burned up with fire. Thus shall it be in the conclusion of the eon. So we see many occasions where it's talking about the conclusion or end of an individual eon. And we see, we've seen examples of the conclusion of the full eons, the full eonian times. Matthew 24, 3. Now at his, Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what is the sign of thy presence, and of the conclusion of the eon? Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to be keeping all, whatever I direct you, and lo, I am with you all, the days till the conclusion of the eon. Again, we have conclusions of the eon. Hebrews 6, 5. In tasting the ideal declaration of God besides the powerful deeds of the impending eon. So we're in this current wicked eon, and there's an eon that's impending, that's coming. Now, Ephesians 2, 7 is very critical also. These are all critical, but some of these we really have to understand to, to get God's picture of the eonian times. That he has established that in the oncoming eons plural he should be displaying the transcendent riches of his grace and his kindness to us in Christ Jesus now this is very important let's take a look at my note here much of Christianity teaches that there is only one age or eon to come after this current wicked eon and this misunderstanding contributes greatly to their distortion of God's purpose for the eon which includes his will that all would be saved. 1 Timothy 2 4. Luke 133 goes on to tell us about these eons. Jesus shall reign over the house of Jacob for the eons, and of his kingdom there shall be no consummation. So Jesus has not begun to reign on this earth over the house of Jacob, but when he does that, sitting on the throne of David, it will be for two eons, the next two eons. And we see in Revelation 11:15, and the seventh messenger trumpets and loud voices occurred in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world became our Lord's and his Christ, and he shall be reigning for the eons of the eons, the next two eons. Revelation 22:5, and night shall be no more, and they have no need of lamplight and sunlight, for the Lord God shall be illuminating them, and they, those reigning on earth with Jesus, shall be reigning for the eons of the eons. 
So those humans that reign with Christ on the earth will have the same duration of reign as Christ for the eons of the eons. Now Mark 3.29, this deals with what's called the unpardonable or unforgivable sin. Yet whoever should be blaspheming against the Holy Spirit is having no pardon for the eon, but is liable to the Aeonian penalty for the sin. In Matthew 12.32, dealing with the same subject. And whosoever may be saying a word against the Son of Mankind, it will be pardoned him. Yet whoever may be saying aught against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be pardoned him, neither in this eon, nor in that which is impending. Now this gives us a little more clarity here. In the first, in Mark 3.29, it says they'll have no pardon for the eon. Okay, we understand that. But it goes on to say in this eon or in that which is impending. So that's two eons. But there's a third eon to come after that. If you count the, the present eon we're in now and the one coming, that's when this sin cannot be forgiven. But there's an eon after that in which this sin can be forgiven. Otherwise, we have found a sin that Jesus did not pay the price for. But John 1.29 tells us clearly, Lo, the Lamb of God, which is taking away the sin of the world. He took away all of the sin including the so-called unpardonable sin. It is pardonable. There's just a certain time when it is not pardonable. Luke 20, 34 through 35. And answering, Jesus said to him, The sons of this eon are marrying and are taking out in marriage, yet those deemed worthy to happen upon that eon and the resurrection from among the dead are neither marrying nor taking out in marriage. So this is differ differentiating between this current eon where people are marrying and that eon, which is speaking of the eon that contains the millennium. And that's the eon that the Jews were laser focused on when the Messiah would come and rule on the throne of David. That is the eon, the two eons that uh, Jesus is distinguishing here, the current one and the one coming. Revelation 20, 10. An adversary who was deceiving them was cast into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the wild beast, where the false prophet are also. And they shall be tormented day and night for the eons of the eons. So we see that Christ reigns for the eons of the eons. And 1 Corinthians 15, I believe it's 24, tells us he reigns until he accomplishes everything that God has for him to accomplish. So there's an end to Christ's reign. There's an end to the reign of those who reign with him. And based on this, the eons of the eons, the same time frame, Satan's judgment in the lake of fire, his torment in the lake of fire is limited. Now, a lot of people don't like the idea that Satan is saved, but you'll have to take that up with God. If you look at Philippians 2, 9 through 11, it talks about every knee bowing before him and acclaiming him. And confessing him before God. And if you look at Colossians 1, 15 through 20, that encompasses all of creation. And Satan is included in that. But this verse, it's very key. I, I want to point out a couple things here on mistranslations of the torment that is for the eons of the eons. In the note here, some mistranslations of this verse lead to the false teaching of eternal or everlasting torment and eternal or everlasting annihilation. The New American Standard Bible says they'll be tormented forever and ever. Which forever and ever is quite an interesting translation. Is not forever, forever? Why does and ever have to be added to forever? It just doesn't make any sense. Well, the translators are playing a theological game to try to promote their theology of eternal torment or eternal annihilation or everlasting, however you want to say it, through mistranslation. So forever and ever is just a ridiculous translation of for the eons of the eons. The common English Bible has forever and always, which again is promoting everlasting torment. Uh, 1599 Geneva Bible says forevermore. Again, that's ongoing. Phillips says for timeless ages. I don't quite understand that one, but it leads me to think when I read it that it's never ending. And the message has around the clock for ages without end. 
and mounts has for all time. All these mistranslations lead us to believe that this judgment and punishment of the adversary is forever and ever. It's unending, but that's not what the scriptures teach based on the definition of aeon. So let's do a quick review here with some encouraging words. God and his son were before the eons. The eons have ends, therefore each eon following each end has a beginning until there's no beginning after the final eon until the conclusion of the eons which brings the eonian times to a glorious close with god and christ accomplishing god's purpose of the eons that god may be all in all first corinthians 15 28. two eons will follow this present wicked eon they will be two glorious eons each with its own cosmos or system they will be the eons of the eons. Number one will be the eon which includes the millennium, and number two will be the eon of the new heaven and new earth. So we see through this study, at least it's clear to me, I mean, you have to make up your own mind, that aeon does not mean eternity. Therefore, aeonios cannot mean eternal. So the judgments that God speaks about in the New Testament are eonian, pertaining to and limited to the eons. Matthew 25, 46 speaks of chastening eonian. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 speaks of eonian extermination. Hebrews 6, 2 speaks of judgment eonian. Jude 7 and Matthew 25, 41 speak of fire eonian. Judgments are not eternal, Obviously, because all judgments on humans and created beings have a beginning, so they can't be eternal. But they are not even everlasting, and we'll get to that in just a moment. I hope this encourages you as you see some of these scriptures that give us a clear understanding that eons are framed by a beginning and an end. So now let's look at the question, does aeonios mean everlasting? Well, does it? Many translations do not use eternal to translate aeonios in regard to judgment. Instead, they use everlasting. Is this a correct translation of aeonios? First, remember everything we just looked at concerning aeon. Aeons have beginnings and ends. Now, concerning everlasting, realize that there are Greek words that God used in the New Testament to teach that something is everlasting. But he did not use those Greek words to speak about judgment. He used Ionios, which pertains to the Aeons. So we see in 2 Corinthians 1.9 in the King James Version, it uses the term everlasting destruction to speak of Aeonios destruction. The New International Version does the same in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, everlasting destruction. The New King James Version, Everlasting Destruction. Well, let's keep going. So here are three of the ways that God expresses the idea of everlasting in the New Testament. That he could have used for judgment and punishment, but he didn't. Do we think God knows what words he wants to use to convey his truth? I think he does. 1 Timothy 1.4, nor yet be heeding myths and endless genealogies which are affording exactions rather than God's administration which is in faith. The word endless here is from the Greek apparantos, which means on other side, which means there's no other side to this duration. It occurs only this one time in the New Testament. Again, God could have used Apparantos when speaking of punishment and judgment, but he didn't. Hebrews 7.16 Who has not come to be according to the law of a fleshly precept, but according to the power of an indissoluble life. Indissoluble is from the Greek akatalutos, which means undown loose or undemolishable. It occurs only this one time in the New Testament. Again, God could have used this word to describe the punishment, undemolishable, meaning never-ending, 
nonstop. This one isn't quite as much of a time word as uh, we saw in the previous example, but again, God could have used this to describe judgment and punishment, but he did not. And we see a third way that God um, in the New Testament expresses the idea of everlasting. In this example, he uses a combination of two words. Luke 133, speaking of the kingdom that Jesus establishes, and of his kingdom there shall be no consummation. No consummation denotes endlessness by use of two words combined. The Greek auk and telos, meaning no end. And a combination similar to this is used in Hebrews 7.3. Having neither a beginning of days nor consummation of life. Nor consummation comes from the Greek mede and telos, meaning nor end. So again, God could have said that the punishment has no consummation. But he did not. He used the word aeonios, which, again, is tied with the noun aeon, which has a beginning and an end. So the punishment is not eternal, and it is not everlasting. It is aeonios, which denotes beginning and end. And this should be good news to us. I hope it is. Because no matter what punishment someone undergoes, I think it's vitally important to understand that God has a plan for each and every person, even those that undergo his strictest punishment. Because Jesus died to save all, and Jesus did save all through his death and resurrection. So when somebody when someone tells you about everlasting or eternal destruction, hopefully now you have the ammunition and the knowledge to be able to uh, refute them, to discuss with them, whatever God leads you to do in that situation. But now you can stand your ground knowing that the words God used are words that denote his grace and mercy, that no matter what punishment comes, it is not everlasting or eternal.